ago, my life was pretty great. I had two successful albums and an international performing career, and I was married to Jeff. Jeff was my best friend and my soulmate ever since our first date at Burning Man 16 years before. <laughs> we had a perfect son, and we lived in a cute house in the woods. But Jeff wasn't feeling well. He had a cough that wouldn't go away, and he hurt all over. It was the day after our son's fourth birthday when he was so out of breath that he couldn't walk across a room. That day in the ER, a doctor told us that my healthy, handsome, vegetarian husband, who had never smoked a day in his life, had advanced lung cancer. He had a softball-sized tumor in one lung, a walnut-sized tumor in the other. The cancer had cracked his ribs and broken his femur all the way across. He had more than 40 brain tumors. The doctor said to us, I estimate you have six to eight weeks to live. I'm sorry. And then he left the room. Caring for Jeff and our son became my new full-time job. Our cute house in the woods was miles from the local cancer center and even farther from the specialists. We spent hours in the car. And I learned firsthand how fractured our healthcare system can be. None of the hospitals could share data with each other. I digitized all of Jeff's records, but no provider could ever use them. One day, I drove 200 miles with my son in the car just to deliver an imaging disk. And then there was the insurance company. Right off the bat, they denied coverage for Jeff's treatment. And they seemed to deny everything as a matter of course, unless I called them. So I spent hours on the phone. As for Jeff, he just decided he was going to get better. While I dove into research, I learned everything I could about lung cancer and clinical trials. And he asked me, please, to not share that information with him. Under no circumstances were statistics to be believed, or was the word terminal ever to be used. Jeff said that if he had any doubt, and particularly if he had any doubt from me, he didn't think he'd have the strength to get better. I had a blog. I was known for my blog, where I told my audience everything about my life. And it started to diverge from the truth, because I knew Jeff was reading it. And he did pretty well in treatment. <laughs> After three months, his CT scans no longer lit up. That big tumor in his lungs was small. And the brain tumors were no longer visible on an MRI. But the oncologist said, you've done really well. But when the cancer comes back, it's a when, not an if. The next day, I heard Jeff say on the phone to a family member, the doctor says I've done well. I'm going to beat this. I was so scared about what was coming. But when I tried to tell anyone, no one believed me, because of course we all wanted to believe in Jeff. Of course the doctor was right. That winter, the brain tumor started to grow back, and by the time we realized it, it was fast. One day at home, he had a seizure, and he died in my arms. And we never had a chance to say goodbye. So after the flurry of the memorial, I was back in the forest with my son. Somehow, I got him to preschool every morning and picked him up in the afternoon. But in the hours in between, horrible scenes of those last weeks just waited for me in every corner. The number of people in my life got smaller and smaller. It's like I was living behind a wall of glass. But 
I had to make a living. I took on a high-pressure job writing music for a Hollywood TV series. I liked the work, and it gave me something to do at night when, frankly, I hadn't slept for months. My music is made of many, many loops of cello that I organize into a larger whole. And while I could write music for television, my own music had stopped. I was stuck. It's like I was playing the same loop over and over and over again. I couldn't make it into a bigger whole. If music is sound organized through time, for me, time had stopped. I had no narrative. Eventually, I had to give a concert. That's what I do, I give concerts. <laughs> I warned the audience that I might dissolve into a puddle of tears. We love you, Zoe. <laughs> and then everybody started to say, we love you. And I got a standing ovation before I even played a single note. <laughs> I was so surprised. <laughs> I don't remember any of that concert, but I think it was good. <laughs> um, I just poured everything into it, all of my hurt and my isolation and my anger. And I felt so accepted and connected. And for the first time in ages, I felt kind of okay. So that was more than a year ago. And since then, I've played a lot more concerts. I moved out of the forest. I'm not so isolated anymore. And I've been making my own music. Music for me has always been a way to communicate. Like, sometimes I feel it's just more direct. It's, it's more direct than words. But what I hadn't realized before is how the listeners are such an important part of the process. That the sharing of the music is as important as the making of it. And when I play music, and when somebody tells me that they experience something, even if it's different than what I intended, I feel so understood, and I feel connected. It's like the loops get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, I'm just gonna play a new song. <laughs> I wrote it in conjunction with this TED Talk. And, uh, It's not finished yet, because I'm not finished. <laughs> um, its working title is, I think, Possible. <laughs> 